name is Arun Gupta, and I lead the Open Ecosystem team at Intel. Open source has been around for 30 years, Kubernetes for the last 10, and AI is certainly making inroads into everything we do. Today, we're going to be talking about an amalgamation of these technologies, and I'm super excited for a really expert on that topic, Priyanka Sharma, who's the executive director for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Hello, Priyanka. Hi, Arun. Thank you so much for having me. Very happy to have you here. All right, so let's do a warm-up question, actually. <laughs> I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, mm -mm. <laughs> and uh, I realized your title a decade ago was Enthusiastic Entrepreneur. <laughs> and it says, uh, the description says, uh, worked on multiple ideas, raised capital, and ultimately found my passion for developer products. Developers are the kingmaker these days, so how has that startup experience and that approach from over a decade ago has shaped your mindset as you face new opportunities and challenges? Sure, boy, 10 years, it's been a while. But when I think of that time, it truly was the beginning for me. I, as my description said, landed upon DevTools developer products by accident. We were trying all kinds of ideas and the one that stuck was this uh, time tracker application for developers. And I really got so lucky because we, experimented with open source in that our plugins for that time tracker were open source so people mm -hmm. can build and track time for anything. And that's when my eyes opened to this whole new world, which had been around since decades, and as we know now, is gonna be around for decades and centuries, of people coming together, building what's needed, and doing it with fun and collaboration around the globe. So that was an amazing experience. Then over time, I next actually worked at a startup where I um, was working with folks who had done a lot of the infrastructure work at Google and built the distributed tracing and monitoring technologies over there. And so that was my next for like deeper foray into open source and uh, infra because I learned all about the Google-inspired infrastructure. And so these two startup experiences, they just kept snowballing because what happened at Lightstep, the company I joined, is that we created this project called Open Tracing, which ended up being the third one to join CN what we now know as CNCF back in 2016. And it was, you know, the only way to succeed in that time, and I believe today, was to bring your whole passion, like you do when you're starting a company, to the growth and benefit of a technology. I did that with open tracing and then subsequently for everything I've been involved in. So in that way, I'm still very much the enthusiastic entrepreneur. Yeah, and that is very evident in everything that you do around the cloud native community. So certainly a testament Thank to you. that. Thank you. Let's build that up a little bit. You were on the cusp of something really big with cloud native. You know, the mission of CNCF is making cloud native ubiquitous. You know, the cloud native landscape has definitely evolved over the last 10 years. Is CNCF still holding on to that mission? Yes, I think the beauty of our mission, right, with making cloud native ubiquitous is that it grows with you. At first, in the very beginning, we were popularizing containers, container orchestration with Kubernetes and making sure Kubernetes became the de facto container orchestration system. And then slowly over time, what we realized was that it's not just about the containers or the orchestration, it's about the people who are building this. And these are the folks who are keeping systems afloat, no matter how they're doing it, no matter which company they work at. And those people have been the movement behind cloud native. And so cloud native has grown wider in its de definition. Today, it's not just about containers. Today, we have WebAssembly projects, which some people would say is the opposite of containers. Today, we're looking at AI workloads all the way from training, fine tuning to inference. So the definition of cloud native has grown to be more about how do we run large scale systems at scale in production resiliently and efficiently. So in that definition, the mission scales with the community and I think it, we are still very true to it. Very true, you know, I mean, they say, in order to gain ubiquity, you have to cede control. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've seen in CNCF. You know, you are ceding control, giving that control to the maintainers, and that's what makes it ubiquity, because that's why everybody is attracted towards yes. CNCF to drive that mission forward. Now. What have been the major milestones and challenges faced by organization CNCF mm -hmm. during this transformation? You started as just as a container orchestration yes. 
Kubernetes was the first project and the poster child. Right. What are the challenges that you have seen? So a lot has changed naturally mm. from when we were a one project foundation to now 190 plus, right? So it's a whole different ballgame. Now we have tiers of projects like sandbox, incubation, graduating, and a very robust and complex ecosystem and community behind it. So the challenges mirror the stage we've been. You know, we started off, uh, I think there's that, um, you know, the crossing the chasm book, which mm -hmm. ha shows that how you first have the early adopters, then you get uh, excitement and then it spreads and then you do have a little bit of a trough and then it goes back up. And uh, I'm- Laggards. Yes, Laggards. yes. And, and like, you know, you cross the chasm into mainstream. Right. And so we faced different challenges based on what stage we were. The first few years, Chris and Dan, who were leading the foundation at the time, they were on the plane 24 seven, telling the world about Kubernetes. That was the number one priority, right? That, hey, this is the container orchestration system of choice. You need to fall behind this. Over time, that became successful. Then it was that let's really be the home for vendor neutral collaboration. And that's when bringing all the cloud, uh, big clouds to partner on Kubernetes was the next challenge they faced. And it was executed beautifully with a lot of you know, back and forth and complications, but the results are out. And then fast forward to today, what are our challenges? Number one is keeping up with this extremely productive community that goes and solves whatever problem it sees ahead of itself. Our job is to nurture them and offer the support we can for them to be the stars and do the work, right? So keeping up, first thing. The second is, just very awkward right now is that AI workloads are slightly different from the previous workloads we've been used to. And so for one element of that is that uh, training workloads have been more like batch workloads, right? And uh, not very similar to uh, the usual uh, stateless systems that Kubernetes and the cloud native They could run for days and months. Years even I've heard, Years, yeah. yeah. And so that's a very different paradigm. And I'm so proud to say that we're on it, we're working on it. Uh, but that is one of the challenges. And then of course, as you know, with the ooms like order of magnitude improvements where we've gone from chat applications to agentic workflows, it's gonna be order of magnitude complexity in running that too. And we have to solve for it. Absolutely, and I think that kind of very well leads into my next question, which is like, AI has impacted every industry. Yes. I wanna learn how is AI used within CNCF and how is CNCF enabling AI workloads you know, across those 190 projects? Absolutely, so <clears throat> as you said, AI is all pervasive right now, right? So there are many angles with which this is impacting cloud native. So one, the big uh, thing that I alluded to right now is we need to make sure we serve these workloads just like any other workload, right? Because when you have a system that's running, if you have a platform engineering team in any company, you can't be like, we do everything but that. So we have to bring it all together. And that's where the effort, it's inspiring to see really. You see it in the Kubernetes SIGs and working groups. You see it in the TAGs, the technical advisory groups for CNCF. So uh, there's the C, um, AI working group that's happening. There is a batch working group. There's SIG really, everyone is looking into this problem and trying to solve it. And the nice thing is that folks who were not traditionally considered part of the cloud native hubbub, right? Like more super compute type of people, they're coming in and blending their expertise and enthusiasm to solve this problem. So that's one big area of ex effort that's going on. Um, I talked about this in my previous keynote about how even Slurm, which has been the traditional way you manage uh, research workloads, HPC workloads, they're trying to find ways to make it work on Kubernetes. Right. So that's one big avenue. The other avenue which really impacts our end users today is that every <laughs> vendor out there offers AI enhanced capabilities now, right? Like use my software or my product and your infra will be a breeze, 100X productivity gains. And what they're asking us is, help us evaluate what is marketing, what is reality. Right. So now we're starting to talk about it. We're really fortunate to have the technical and uh, advisory board from the end users. And uh, this may be a topic that they'll be picking up for papers to create to give guidance to the industry. And along those lines, we have uh, some cool projects that have joined CNCF. There's one called Kate's GPT, uh, being able to use um, chat style commands for Kubernetes. So there's, these are the three, I would say, three types of ways AI is impacting cloud native today.
Very true. And <clears throat> what I've seen really is, you know, Kubernetes has sort of become the de facto compute layer. Mm -hmm. So no matter what kind of workload you want to run, if that is what is already running in your environment, that is a natural choice. And if you remember, yes. we were at the TED AI hackathon last year, and when we asked these folks, where are you running your AI workloads? Kubernetes. Obviously. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was the question. So like, it is obvious it is running on Kubernetes. Yes. I think we may not know these stories, but they're all existing today. Exactly. And I think, you know, whenever there's a new technology, there's always managed services are the first that rise it to the top, understandably, because it's fast, um, fastest way to try something out. But once enterprise gets interested, that's when the in true infra story comes out where Kubernetes is at the center. That is right. All right, let's pivot a little bit. With the increasing adoption of AI and LLMs, hmm. how will hybrid cloud environments become more complex? You know, with the data jurisdiction, yeah. compute capacity, how would that change in the cloud native landscape? I think we're in for a whole new world, <laughs> as uh, the Little Mermaid says. So it, there are many complexities that come in with such a paradigm shift in technology. Uh, how we think about uh, security, how do we think about uh, safety and data, um, uh, data sovereignty, things like that. And I wouldn't say they're all solved problems right now. We're all grappling with them. I think that we have created a good paradigm with the cloud native ecosystem on how to manage these concerns. And as you know, there are projects on the landscape on each of these categories. Now we need to solve them for the AI workloads, which essentially means like an order of magnitude more complex. Same issues, but different level of complexity or um, the numbers are higher. And so I think it's a work in progress problem and that's why I ask everybody to come to the cloud native ecosystem, to come to the cube cons that we host so that we can all collaborate on that. Yeah, I think that's essential because you know these are global challenges. No one vendor, one foundation, one company can solve them together and as you said earlier, it requires a global collaboration. Open yes. source is the best way to accomplish that. Absolutely. Super. Um, Let's talk about Kubernetes leadership a little bit. You know, of the 26 graduated projects, Kubernetes is the most popular one by far, right? I mean, we celebrated his 10th birthday earlier this year. How do you see its role evolving over the next decade? Yes, you know, some folks said at this 10 year birthday that we're having Kubernetes' Linux moment, which is actually being powered by it powering the AI movement. And so that's been a big compliment, of course. But I think it will evolve similar to how Linux evolved, where it is still the underpinning of everything, and it keeps changing to make, make room for all the new uh, innovations and technologies that occur. I think um, our communities are different, but we are looking more and more similar to Linux in the type of impact we're going to have. And if we reach that milestone, which was 10 years for us, it's been 30 years for Linux, we will be so fortunate. Right, and I think as we were talking about ubiquity, yeah. that's where CNCF is ceding control, enabling more and more of these maintainers. And so is anybody's guess on where it would be, if somebody would have asked us, would Kubernetes reach the Linux moment 10 years ago? People are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly, so I think it's Absolutely. exciting, but yeah. really enabling that ubiquity that is critical. Yeah, it's kind of like they say, right? If you love something, set it free. <laughs> right, and if it loves you back, it will come back. Yes, exactly. and here's, here, it's flourishing. No, absolutely, and I think we started talking about that element. Initially, when cloud native community started, we started with state full, state less workloads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we did state full workloads. Um, then we realized, hey, by the way, um, serverless workloads, mm -hmm. now AI. Yep. So the workload is evolving, but the platform continue to evolve as well. What is the next wave, you know, if it's anybody's guess, what do you think, where it's going, and how would Kubernetes continue to evolve to meet that workload? It's anybody's guess, so don't quote me. <laughs> but I will say, we see a lot of promise in Wasm, in WebAssembly, because it's a good, good way to tie everything together. If we think about the long-term future, right? We're not there yet, but it can have a big impact even on AI workloads and how we manage those in cloud native. And there are many um, solutions people are working on, and I really just hope that we are able to focus on being use case oriented with Wasm because the promise is really there. And I think that's a good point because, you know, it's not about, hey, Wasm is a competitor to containers. 
CNCF has always been about in more inclusive mm -hmm. than exclusive. We got to make these workloads run. That's the point, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how do you think has the open source software ecosystem contributed to the growth of AI and machine learning? You know, I mean, AI, the concept has existed for decades, mm -hmm. but more recently, there's been a lot more debate about open versus closed, which yeah. is better. How do you think open source is contributing to that? So I do think, you know, things are just a little bit more complicated in the AI world, especially when you're looking at models, right? There are so many layers, which part's open source, which part is not. And there's also questions around licensing in terms of, does a license even adequately have the language to cover a full model, right? So there's some people are, if they see Apache 2 MIT license for any project regardless, are happy, that's open source. And generally that's my opinion too. But then, as I recently learned, that license doesn't fully cover data, right? And so when that's the case, would you consider a model open source or not? From my perspective, people's intentions really matter. So if they started with Apache to MIT, that's a very good sign. You know, at least they started at the best possible level that they could. But then there is also the Linux Foundation actually has released the CDLA, uh, Common De Developer License Agreement. Um, Sorry, I'm getting the acronym wrong, but CDLA, that's the one. And that's the one that takes care of the data story, right? And that's what we recommend for someone who wants a truly open model. And there are some that are with that licensing available. Right. So I would say it's much more complex in this new world of AI. Open source, has it gets more layered. And I think we should just give each other grace and do the best we can. And ultimately, we'll arrive at things that feel comfortably open source over time. Well, I think you you put it very well that in this open source community, it's very important to give each other space and yes. grace. Because mistakes will happen. This is very early in the cycle. We're all learning. Exactly. And OSI, Open Source Institute, yes. they came up with the recent open source uh, AI definition where they're really talking about source, mm -hmm. data, and model. And that's what you're talking exactly. about. Okay. So source is, of course, OSI approved yeah. license, data for that they have come up with the CDLA, right. and then model, you know, what are the three different things required? What are the required things versus optional things? Right. I think that is where the industry is gravitating towards yes. in terms of the open source AI. And I think that's really good and important because one thing that happens in, you know, early stages where people are unsure is that there tends to be a bit of open source washing where people will say, well, it's open, you can see the source code, but then you look at the license and there's a lot of requirements or limits on how much you can use something or the other. And this clarity and leadership by OSI Linux Foundation is essential to get us on the right path that the end users want and need. Correct, because bringing that common language so that everybody agrees upon this is the language and we can yeah. all go that way is essential. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about hardware. You know, how has the evolution of hardware, particularly in areas like distributed computing, serverless architecture, and now in AI, that has influenced actually software development practices? So I am by no means a hardware expert, so I want to give that caveat before I even say anything. But what I am noticing is that, you know, two years ago even, hardware was such a commodity, right? We weren't really thinking about hardware. It was like, oh yeah, I'm running on this or that, or I'm doing a hybrid or whatever it is. It was still very commoditized. Even bare metal was quite commoditized. Now with the advent of AI, things have really changed, right? Because we're stretching the limits. The orders of magnitude that we need on the compute front have suddenly increased. And so it's essential for software and hardware teams to understand each other a lot more. Right. I myself am making the effort to understand and learn because without that, then you're like looking at half the picture. You're not right. gonna win. Right. So I think this is a time which, you know, on a smaller scale, the DevOps movement was similar where developers had to understand what op operations people were doing. Right. Now hardware and software really need to reacquaint, reacquaint themselves with each other. And we have seen efforts like DRA coming to mm -hmm. CNCF where they're really talking about, you know, how do we make these and run in a neutral manner? Yes, and honestly, you know, I'll have conversations with folks who are more um, aware of the hardware story and I'll bring up something very particular or specific that, oh, we're working on this in Kubernetes. And they're like, that's great. But just so you know, the hardware company is thinking, which state do I put this in? <laughs> you know, it's like much more um, tangible 
and real world problems that, that are faced right now. Right. And I think we have to meet each other where we are. So what are the key challenges software developers face in optimizing applications for modern hardware architectures? A little bit more on the hardware side of it, but tell me more about it. Like, What is cloud native community doing around that? So this is very much uh, a conversation in the making, right? Because it, as we discussed, this is suddenly a new la layer of complexity that people didn't have to face. And this is where I'm really glad that with the cloud native movement, the end users, the large Fortune 5000, have put in place what we're now calling platform engineering teams. So these are the teams that are in charge of making your developer platform work for every rank and file developer. And that's where a lot of these discussions are being had. Like, how do we proceduralize this of this kind of workload, this type of feature equates to this type of compute or GPU or whatever we are using? Right. And so I think this is an area that is very uh, important right now because it's also directly connects to costs. And it's also that is being evolved, that's being solved as we go. And the good news, and this is what goes back to, I'm glad the platform engineering teams exist, is if you recall in the early days of the cloud, it was like, oh, whoops, we suddenly have an $80 million bill for, for compute because right. people were just trying to figure it out on their own and many were not aware of hey, it's not a bottomless pit of a compute that's free, right? And so that the discipline developed going through that journey of becoming responsible uh, cloud resource users is now being very useful when we have suddenly a lot more complexity on the hardware side. And there's definite movement on the FinOps side as well. Yes. On how do we bring that metering telemetry to the front. And one of the changes that I've seen also is in your config YAML on how you deploy your Kubernetes application, there's a generic portion, and then if you want to run on a specific hardware, you can request that. So I think yes. in, turn, in that sense, it provides that inclusivity and the choice back to the customer itself. Yeah, it's that mode of giving optionality, like you know, guardrails and optionality together. You have to have both to strike innovation, but also not bankrupt yourself. Right. And I think that's where the platform edge teams are leveraging their Kubernetes systems. Super, this is a fantastic discussion. Let me bring my closing question here. CNCF has been immensely successful over the last 10 years. You know, I've seen the journey on the governing board for the last seven along with you. What is your vision to keep it ready for the next decade and beyond? We've been so fortunate. We've been so lucky to have each other has been the biggest thing that I've known in the last 10 years. Yes, it's you, it's me, it's all the 250,000 plus contributors, it's the seven million developers who use cloud native every day. That's the power of the collaborative, of the collective coming together. And my goal is to keep nurturing it. It goes back to the people, we are here to amplify them, support them. They've got this. They're gonna handle the workloads and CNCF needs to be that welcoming, inclusive, vendor neutral space where we prioritize the quality of the output. And I think that's certainly true when we are thinking at the governing board level, at the TOC level, in the technical advisory board level, everywhere, that inclusion element, you know, everybody is kind of thinking in that direction, and that's where it starts. Yes, exactly. So Priyanka, we talked about open source, community, different kind of workloads, past decade, next decade. Where do you, uh, what is your call to action to the folks listening? What should they think about? That is a great question, Arun. And really this journey has been so inspiring to be a part of, to watch, and to be part, a participant in, right? We have moved mountains as an ecosystem, as a community, and we will continue to do so. That's the best part of this group of people. So my call to action to anybody listening is come, join in. Bring your workloads, bring the challenges you're facing, and don't worry if you feel, oh, these systems people are different. We're all here to learn from each other. And together, we will make the next era of distributed systems, the next era of technology and innovation happen. I think that's awesome, actually. So yeah, come see us at KubeCon, join the Slack channels. Yes, absolutely. You know, this is a very welcoming, inclusive place. Yes, for those who don't know, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con are our flagship uh, conferences. They're the largest open source vendor neutral events in the world. And uh, the next one is actually next week in Hong Kong. So <laughs> if you come for that, great. Otherwise, we have Salt Lake City happening in November, and I would love to see everyone there. 
Well, fantastic, Priyanka. I really had a good time conversing with you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great time, as always. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye, folks.